Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone from all over the world. Welcome to the CKS webinar. Um, please be informed that uh, in addition to the live webinar in the Zoom, uh, we will have also our uh, webinar live on our CKS Facebook page. And later on, the recorded video will be made available in our YouTube channel and CKS website. Um, my name is Soon Phun Lu. I'm a program manager at the Center for Khmer Study. And in case some of you haven't known about uh, uh, the Center for Khmer Study, uh, the Center for Khmer Study or CKS is a non governmental organization and a non profit organization working to promote uh, research, teaching, and uh, public service in the field of social science, humanity, and art uh, in Cambodia and the Mekong River. In the Mekong River region, up until today, we have served this mission for over 25 years. And we have two offices. Our main office is at uh, Siem Reap province, and our second office is in Phnom Penh. And may I would like to introduce uh, the audience to our topic today, which is about the farmer technology chain decision, theory and evidence from Cambodia. And we have uh, Rachel Brown as our speaker today. Rachel Brown is a US State Department full Pride fellow currently living in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, conducting research with small holder farmer using economic analysis to model chain behavior risk and insurance demand. While as an economic student at the George Washington University in the Washington DC, she studied the major determinant of poverty for farmer in Siem Reap, Cambodia. And before that, she worked on hydroponic social venture in Cambodia. She graduated from the George Washington DC, Washington University with a BS in international affairs and economics. Her research interests include agricultural economic, microfinance, risk and insurance. Again, our top our uh, webinar topic today is farmer technology chain decision, theory and evidence from Cambodia. In this webinar, Racha will share her research about technology adoption and behavior change of farmer in Cambodia. During this discussion, she will describe the agricultural economic landscape in Cambodia and how that informed the constraint on technology adoption as well as explaining common series of adoption. She will detail the result of a study conducted with the National Institute of Agriculture that explores the major risks and challenges that farmers face and how this impact their behavior. Finally, she will conclude the presentation with the interpretation of the study results and policy implications that they inspire. For the flow of the webinar, after the presentation, you can ask her question by putting your question in the um, uh, chat box and for our audience in the Facebook page. Please put your question in the comment section and our uh, organize team, organizer team will pass the question to the moderator. Um, Rachel, do you have any question? No, that sounds great. So the floor is yours. Okay, great. Let me share my screen and I'll go into my presentation. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So thank you all for coming today, hopefully we can dive into some good policy implications, um, really get to know technology adoption in Cambodia better. Uh, over the last six or seven months, I've been able to uh, research how farmers in Cambodia go about changing their behavior when it comes to their farming practices. Um, and it's the study has yielded some really interesting insights into how the agriculture sector in Cambodia can be better developed. Uh, I'll go into that more later, but uh, let's dive in. So first in this presentation, I'll go over some of the overall agricultural economic context in Cambodia, 
just a brief introduc introduction about why the topic of technology adoption is so important. And then I'll go into more of the study specifics, talk about uh, the research questions, some of the theories used, and the methodology. And then we'll go into uh, results and the interpretation of those results and the policy implications. And ultimately, that's really the most important part of this study. Uh, hopefully we can come out with some good data and some good ideas for Cambodia's agricultural landscape moving forward. So ultimately, this research is about why farmers change their behavior, why others do not change their behavior. Understanding how this decision-making process takes place is really critical in developing agricultural productivity in Cambodia. This Another reason why this study is interesting is because in this study, there's farmers who grow rice, farmers who grow cashews. You have farmers who have one hectare of land, farmers who have 100 hectares of land. So if you contrast this with a lot of studies that only focus on rice farmers or only focus on farmers that use moisture meters, there's a really great variety in the study that lends to really strong analysis. And before I go any further, I want to give a really big thank you to Prekli National Institute of Agriculture their team and the students I worked with uh, to help me enumerate the study and conduct the study, do the logistics for everything, uh, just guide me throughout the process. They're absolutely critical. And then the research was also made possible through funding from the US State Department and their uh, Fulbright Fellowship. So starting out before we get any further, how does this research define technology adoption? So very broadly speaking, uh, technology adoption is anything that changes how you use your inputs and how they create outputs. So if you have a set amount of inputs, so this might, for farmers, this is going to include fertilizer, this is going to include land. So the technology is anything you do that alters those inputs to become outputs, like rice, like cassava. So in this sense, technology is defined very broadly. So it is not simply something that you're doing on your phone. It's not uh, any sort of thing with SMS messaging or apps. Uh, it's really how you're changing your inputs, uh, how you're allocating these inputs, uh, and what kind of new things you're creating. So just keep that in mind as we go forward uh, and as we, as we talk about technology going forward. Ultimately, the current state of technology adoption in Cambodia is not necessarily ideal. For most farmers, it is not optimal. And this is due to a variety of constraints, which we'll go into, into a little bit. Uh, but technology is really critical because most of the time, farmers have fixed assets. So they have a fixed amount of labor and they have a fixed amount of land. One of the few things that they can change is the technology that they're using. So ensuring that they have optimal access to the technology is critical to raising their incomes. Most of the time farmers, when they do adopt new technology, they'll adopt it as an income generating strategy. So they'll do it as a way to increase their income. They might also do it as a way to mitigate risk. Um, we'll go into more of the specific technology changes later on in the results section, but for now, just keep in mind, it can be really minor things like changing the way that you apply tech, apply fertilizer or changing the quantity of fertilizer that you apply. And there can also be more major changes like how you're actually planting the crops or how you're harvesting the crops if you're using mechanized irrigation versus manual irrigation. Um, so it's a really wide range of types of technology. So extension services uh, are, agricultural training services in Cambodia, and they help farmers to adopt new technology. So they're helping to increase the access that farmers have to this technology. And they can be uh, utilized digitally. So farmers might access them on their phone, email, social media, things like that. But more often they're done in person. So you might see this in like local trainings, uh, an organization like an NGO or the government, uh, a private business, they might come in and train farmers in a commune for a day. Uh, they might come in over, uh, like once a week or once a month for a year. Uh, so these are called extension services and they help farmers to adopt new technology uh, or to change their farming practices, maximize their income. Uh, just keep this definition in mind because it's, it plays a pretty critical role in the technology landscape in Cambodia. 
So we already touched on this briefly, but technology adoption is so important because it's one of the few ways that farmers have in in a very rigid structure. It's one of the few things that they have to really be able to alter their income. So maximizing technology, it increases potentials for growth and poverty reduction. And understanding who has access to that technology and why becomes critical when you're trying to prevent huge income inequalities. Uh, so understanding why certain farmers are adopting technology and why certain farmers are not uh, going forward becomes very critical for understanding income inequalities. So this slide has a lot of information on it, but we'll go through it, so bear with me. Uh, what is kind of the agricultural economic landscape in Cambodia? Ultimately, you have a lot of factors that are cul culminating to uh, a lot of the or high likelihood of poverty traps um, and high uh, or low productivity. So, sorry, I'm just moving um, moving this my Zoom box out of the way so I can see. So anyway, so you have a lot of poverty traps and high indebtedness of the farming population. And this is due to a variety of factors. But one thing that contributes to this is the situation of inefficient production. Now we talked about this a little bit with the low technology adoption, but there's also a lot of other factors that contribute. For one, you have poor infrastructure. So this is things like roads and transport, uh, but it's also things like the electricity grid, mechanized irrigation, all of that stuff is not exactly ideal. You also have uh, limited market linkages. So a farmer might grow a crop, but they, when it's time to harvest the crop and sell the crop, they don't have anyone to sell them to, or they might have someone to sell it to, but it's not at an ideal price for the market. And this ties into Cambodia for farmers. It has very long value chains. So when you start with a farmer, most of the time they sell to a collector. So there'll be a collector in a commune, village, or district that collects a bunch of different crops from the farmers nearby. They might have a truck uh, or van, uh, whatever transport they have to their devices. And then they'll sell those crops to a provincial trader. And then the provincial trader might sell those crops to a processor, so a factory that processes the goods, or they might sell it to a wholesaler or a retailer. So someone sells the crops directly, they might sell it at market or they might export it. But anyway, you see that there's so many factors along the value chains and farmers are going to be getting far and away the lowest crop, or sorry, the lowest price per kilogram out of any of these actors. So with all of these middlemen, uh, the farmers, their prices are going to be re um, reduced. So that's another reason why we see poor market linkages. Um, another couple things I'll touch on for inefficient production are the effects of climate change. So you have increasing weather volatility and uh, soil erosion. So all of these things are going to be adding to, over time, decreasing yields. You also have fractured land holdings. So these are, most of the farmers in Cambodia have relatively small land holdings. So you have a situation where there's high, high, high production, or sorry, high, high, high competition. and relatively low economies of scale. So both of these things are leading to farmers to be price takers and also inefficient production. So farmers being price taking is one of the next things I'm going to talk about. Um, because you have a situation of such high competition and such uh, small land holdings, it's very different, very difficult for farmers to have any sort of bargaining power when it comes to selling their crops. It's also very difficult for farmers to achieve accurate or to obtain accurate market information. Um, so that also limits their bargaining ability. So both of these things, inefficient production and that farmers are price taking, and then all of these uh, items in blue on our left that lead to these things, lead to a very high incidence of poverty for smallholders. However, we do have some strategies uh, on a micro level being undertaken by uh, government ministries and uh, local organizations that are working to combat the situation. So we have extension services, which are these training services for farmers, and we've already discussed that. We also have contract farming, which is a growing movement in Cambodia that has mixed results and frankly, mixed perspectives. So in contract farming, 
you'll have one person or one household or one company that owns a lot of land and owns all of the technology. And then there'll be a lot of farmers who are farming that land and receive a fixed wage or a fixed amount per harvest. And this strategy takes away a lot of the risk that farmers have. So in case of a crop loss, they'll still be obtaining the same wage. So it takes away a lot of the risk. On the flip side of that, it does take away a lot of the uh, agency and freedom that farmers have. So there's mixed perspectives about this within uh, the agriculture or within the development community. Another strategy we see emerging is agricultural cooperatives and farmer associations. So at a very basic level, uh, these cooperatives are designed so that farmers uh, have a platform to or a forum to discuss different challenges that they're facing. Sometimes they're a way that farmers can elect a representative or have better representation in their local government. They can bring up issues. Sometimes they are a way to collectively sell their crops. Sometimes they're a way to collectively buy inputs, like such as fertilizer and seeds. So they have a variety of different functions, but they're ultimately, ultimately designed to overcome these market forces that pose a challenge to farmers. So getting back to some of the more specifics about the research, the overarching research question is, uh, what are the major drivers that are impacting behavior change and technology change for farmers in Cambodia? But diving more into that specifically, what types of technology are being adopted? How does risk play a role in this? How does liquidity play a role in these factors? What about demographic features? What about specific types of technology? So all of those things um, we're going to be taking a closer look at later on. And something I also wanted to touch on specifically is about climate change and what are the dominant experiences about climate change that farmers have in the study. And then also what are the perspectives of climate change for the future that farmers have and how might this inform um, technology adoption decision making. And going about answering these research questions, there's a couple different theories that uh, researchers have used in the past. Uh, the theory that I go with is the theory of planned behavior. Uh, this is a theory developed by a psychologist in the 1980s, and it's commonly used in technology adoption studies because it's a really great theory to understand how people, how people undertake a decision when they have limited information available to them or when it's a situation of high uncertainty. So we see three different things that are playing a key role in behavior. One is attitude. So this includes attitude about technology. So how compatible is this new technology? What is the relative advantage? How easy is it to use? That's going to be the attitude about technology. And then there's going to be other attitudes and like kind of personality traits that are going to play a role. So these include risk preferences, how risk averse is a person, or are they more inclined to take risks? And what we just touched on, so climate change beliefs, this can also play a role in uh, a farmer's attitude and the way that they make decisions. And then you also have the subjective, subjective norms in a commune. So these are the societal perspectives that are about technology. So do you have a leader in the community influencing uh, farmers to, um, to take on a new technology? Is the local government pushing for farmers to take on this new technology? Um, is it viewed relatively positively on a societal level as a whole? So this is a subjective norm. And then finally, we have perceived behavioral control. So this acts as a limiting factor to the what might be positive attitude or a positive subjective norm. So our perceived behavioral control includes access limitations. And this might be due to um, like physical access. So a technology simply just might not be available in a relatively remote area. Or it can include access limitations due to capital. So if a farmer or liquidity. So if a farmer doesn't have enough cash on hand or if they don't have uh, enough land to be able to adopt the technology efficiently. It might also include uh, like technical skills limitations. So if a farmer simply does not have uh, the knowledge or know-how to adopt a, te a new technology, that's going to obviously act as a limiting force. Um, however, extension services 
do act as a way to combat this. You also have structural limitations. And these are some of the things that we discussed a little bit ago. So um, infrastructure limitations, market linkage limitations, high input costs, all of those things are going to lead to uh, reduced perceived behavioral control. So reducing the amount of control that a farmer thinks that they have over their specific situation. Another theory that I want to discuss that's very relevant in uh, how we go about making decisions under uncertainty and is kind of a keystone theory in microeconomics is a theory of expected utility. So under uncertainty, individuals are going to take into account the probability of something occurring and the expected utility or the expected benefit that we receive from that outcome occurring. Now, in an ideal situation, people are going to set, people are going to take this into account and we're going to have this so-called expected utility line where however much income you receive, that's going to be your utility or your benefit. However, in a situation um, such as small holding farming, where a, a crop loss has detrimental effects, we're going to be in a situation with high risk aversion. So if we take two equivalent scenarios where you can achieve $500 with a relatively high risk or $400 with a little bit of a lower risk, those two options are going to have equivalent utility or equivalent benefit. So what that means is we are going to often choose the 400, so these are called our risk premium. So we're going, might choose the lower income option for less risk. This connects back to technology adoption because if you have the option to adopt technology for potentially higher uh, potential income, but also a potential higher risk, you might choose to not adopt that technology to forego the risk. So that's your risk premium. Um, so this theory of expected utility and the theory of planned behaviors, um, we can analyze our results and analyze or create really our model and the structure that we think about decision making and technology adoption around these two theories. Um, what does the literature say about uh, how farmers adopt technology? It's a very widely studied um, process in economics because it's so critical to development. There's some factors that are a consensus across the literature and there's some factors that are widely varied. To start age, education, location, these attitudinal traits have a really widely varied effect. So sometimes age, when it correlates to increased experience, sometimes it increases to a greater likelihood of adopt adopting technology. On the other hand, age also tends to correlate with higher skepticism about new technology. So there's varied effects about these things. One thing that, or I, I should say two things that generally have a strong consensus that have a positive relationship with technology adoption are learning. So social networks, watching farmers uh, that adopt the technology be successful with it, that's going to increase the likelihood of adopting that new technology. So we have to remember technology adoption is an iterative process. So it happens over time, not at like a single moment. So over the years, watching other farmers be successful with the technology, that's going to increase the likelihood that you adopt that new technology. Uh, and then we also see some other varied things. So risk preferences, the impact of wealth and liquidity, all of these factors have a very wide uh, effect on technology adoption. Sometimes there's no effect, sometimes it's negative and sometimes it's positive. Um, in light of this, that's why it's so important that we understand um, Cambodia's local context, because we can't really make generalizations just based on previous research, sorry. Um, we also see that the attributes of technology is really important. So whether or not a farmer thinks that the technology is going to have a strong relative advantage compared to what they're usually using, obviously that's going to play a critical role. So this varies technology by technology. Um, so it's another reason why specific studies about these technologies are so critical. So I've gone over this a little bit, but we'll do a brief rundown 
of the methods I used. The main thing is a survey of over 100 farmers in eastern Cambodia. So we go to Kampong uh, Cham and Tabung Kamum provinces. Uh, so we also uh, use after we have that data, we conduct both qualitative and quantitative analysis. So the qualitative is used is used based on developing some indexes that are designed to understand risk, experience with loans, experience with debt, experience with climate change. So those kind of index indices allow us to better understand uh, the agricultural and economic landscape as a whole. We also have some graphical analysis that just kind of contribute to our general descriptive uh, statistical knowledge of the situation. And then I also use two different models. Uh, I won't go into the specific econometrics behind the models unless anyone has any specific questions, which we can go into later on in the discussion. But I use a, a Craig's double hurdle model, and I also use a fractional logistic regression model. And both of these models are used because they allow us to uh, understand that technology adoption is a two-stage process. So first, farmers decide whether or not they want to adopt technology. But then they also decide the intensity to which they want that adoption. Um, and then it's also a logistic distribution. So what that means is we have a lot of possible outcomes clustered at no adoption and a lot of possible outcomes clustered at full adoption. Um, we can go into that later on, um, but ultimately what it allows us to do is see the relationships between our dependent variables and our independent variables. Again, we'll go into that more later on. So we had a really awesome uh, team of enumerators from uh, practically at National Institute of Agriculture, and we also had uh, Navis, who's in the audience with us today. So they were really instrumental in us being able to conduct the survey. Uh, without them, there's no way that this study would have been possible. And then we also had over 100 farmers who were gracious enough to talk to us, tell us about their livelihoods, invite us into their homes and communities. Um, and it was a really great experience. We learned a lot. Um, and it was um, really insightful in a lot of different ways. So I'll start with some descriptive statistics just so we can get a better understanding of the average farmer in this study. So I have both the measure of mean and median here because our mean is often skewed from a few critical outliers, either on a very low scale or on the very higher end of the scale. So the majority of farmers in the study only had about one hectare of land. Um, but we also do see a couple commercial farmers in the study and they have dozens of hectares of land. So obviously that's going to push our mean upwards. Um, a couple other things to note on this slide. The average farmer has only achieved about a primary age level of education. So this might be five years of education max. So, uh, very limited literacy rates, a uh, very limited understanding of financial data, financial record keeping. So these also act as limiting factors in uh, developing the agricultural sector in Cambodia. I also want to take note that these income all farm and inputs uh, spent per year values that you see, um, take them with a grain of salt again, because Financial record keeping by farmers in Cambodia isn't often exactly the most diligent or tedious or accurate, frankly. So these are all recollective estimates from the previous year. So the extent to which they're accurate and we can use them for statistical analysis is limited, um, but I wanted to include them just so we can have a general idea. But just keep that in mind. We have a lot of binary variables, or these are our variables that are either yes or no or one or the other. So a couple of key things I'll go over on this slide are livestock ownership. So about half the farmers in the study own some sort of livestock. Most often these are chickens, sometimes they're ducks, sometimes they're geese, uh, sometimes they're cattle, uh, infrequently they're water buffalo. Those are a little bit of a, like a higher end commodity or a higher end asset. So those were less often seen in the study. Uh, very few farmers have any sort of mechanized irrigation system. So most of the irrigation is done 
all via like rain fed systems manually, uh, no sort of like electricity needed irrigation systems. Another about half of the farmers in the study have some sort of off farm income. So this could include someone in the household having access to construction work. It could include uh, doing labor on someone else's farm. It might include working in a textile factory. A lot of the farmers sell like juice or tea or um, soda like at roadside stands or in local like community shops. Um, so farmers do have some sort of buffer in case of a crop loss, not all, but some. Another couple things to note are that the vast, vast, vast majority of farmers in the study have experienced a pretty intense loss. So over a third of their crops have been lost in the last five years. Um, however, when we see the usage of preservation strategies, it's a very, very minor portion of the study. So this dichotomy is pretty intense and we'll go more into why that is later on, especially when we're analyzing our model results. Um, not a ton of studies or not a ton of farmers are part of an agricultural co cooperative, um, but we, we will see that as a variable in the model later on just because it is relevant. And we also see high indebtedness. Now, considering the fact that uh, farmers have relatively low incomes and are kind of um, limited by a very capricious weather system, this high indebtedness rate is definitely a cause for concern. And again, we'll discuss that later on. Uh, a general idea of the types of crops planted. So farmers that have much more small land holdings, they're much more likely to grow rice. Uh, some of the farmers that had the smallest land holdings, so think only like a fifth of a hectare of land, oftentimes they didn't even sell any of the rice. They just had the rice for household consumption. Obviously, it was far and away the most grown crop in the study. Farmers that have bigger land holdings, so let's say upwards of five, seven, 10 hectares of land, these farmers are better able to grow cashews or rubber, which are higher value added crops, just cash crops grown only for income. Uh, the types of fruit grown were most often mangoes, bananas, sometimes we had a couple of coconuts thrown in there. Uh, most often bananas though. For vegetables, uh, these were most often like leafy greens, uh, like bok choy, lettuce. Uh, we had a couple instances of like garlic or spring onions. Um, and then we also have kasava thrown into the mix as well. This is another pretty like low value added crop. It's gotten a lot more popular in Cambodia over the last decade or so. And if you'll remember, as I mentioned, uh, it's really common for farmers to experience uh, crop loss. Now, originally going forward, I had expected these losses to be mainly due to like market induced factors. So whether that be contract infidelity, uh, volatile market prices, but in fact, you see that far and away, farmers are much more inclined to describe their losses due to flooding, pests, weeds. So uh, climate induced factors. Now, something that you might notice that uh, obviously these totals add up far more than to 110. Farmers can also, if farmers who have multiple losses can list multiple reasons from a single loss, farmers can also list multiple reasons. Um, so just quick explanation there. Now, what farmers identify is the greatest risk. That, that's really echoing what we see in our previous slide about um, what their main reason for loss is. So obviously we see that whatever the reason behind losses, that's going to impact what you perceive as the greatest risk. Again, we see rain volatility and pests and weeds being the major, the major risks for farmers. So I find this, these statistics to be really interesting because farmers are really good at identifying potential risk mitigation strategies. We see the three most highly identified I, uh, strategies as being joining an agricultural co cooperative, uh, having high crop diversity, so planting multiple different kinds of crops, or having an off-farm source of income. Now, while many farmers participate in these risk mitigation strategies, none of them identified themselves as deciding to do these things due to 
as a way to mitigate risk. So while that might be a secondary effect, and while that might be uh, what that might be happening, so the risk is being reduced, they um, pursued these endeavors as a way just to increase income. So I do think that that's interesting to note going forward. And again, we'll discuss that later on in the results of the model. Uh, what types of technology and behavior change are farmers engaging in? Far and away, the most popular, and uh, this definitely makes sense because it's going to be the easiest to change and it's going to have the greatest relative advantage to so the greatest bang for your buck, is going to be the changing the way that you apply fertilizer, changing the way that you apply pesticides or how much you apply of each. We also see uh, commonly used our technique change. So how do you plow? How do you um, harvest your crops at the end? Uh, and then another common thing that we see, and this is especially common in rice, uh, and that will become pretty, uh, pretty relevant later on when we look at our model results, is switching to a higher yield rice variety. Um, obviously there's other higher variety seeds, but most commonly we see it for rice. However, something I do wanna note is there's very few changes to the strategies to preserve soil and water. Um, when we look at people's climate change experience, which I'll go into, excuse me, I'll go into in a second, uh, this very low number is pretty alarming. First, let's discuss farmers' experience with debt. So about half the study population is indebted. Uh, however, farmers have a pretty negative belief about debt. So debt can be, end quote, a near crippling monthly expense. So this is a cost that prevents households from uh, buying things that they really need. So it can be difficult to escape debt and it's very much like a last resort endeavor. So nevertheless, it's very common for farmers to be in debt. On the flip side of that, farmers have a relatively easy access to loans. In the last uh, couple decades or so, microfinance has become really popular in rural Cambodia. So accessing loans is relatively easy. It's not always cheap, but it is relatively easy. Uh, and it's very common too. So let's get back to farmers experience with climate change. So we asked farmers uh, a series of different statements and we asked them to rank them on a series on a scale of accurate to inaccurate. So some of these statements include that while weather patterns have become more volatile, uh, rainfall has become more volatile, temperature uh, over time, the average yield has decreased. And we also asked them just about their general awareness of climate change. So you'll see that farmers have highly agree that weather has become more volatile and they are experiencing issues related to climate change. And we also see that farmers are very aware of climate change. Um, so this result in light of uh, our understanding that soil preservation strategies and water preservation strategies, that those are very limited in their adoption, understanding the dichotomy between that has some very interesting implications. Again, we will go into that a little bit more when we look at our model results. Speaking of which, the model. Uh, the model is designed, and I, I mentioned earlier, I actually use two models. One is a fractional logistic regression model, and the other is Craig's double hurdle model. And these models were able to understand the effect that the independent variables have on the dependent variables. So we have two independent variables. One is adoption decision, and this is simply a binary variable. It's a yes or no. In the last five years, have farmers adopted any new technologies or changed their farming strategies? And then you have adoption intensity. So just because a farmer adopts a type of technology does not mean they're using it on any more than 10% of their land. So understanding if a farmer adopts it on their entire portion of their land or a partial adoption, that's critical in understanding the types of technologies that are valued and how adoption decision makings happen. Uh, we've gone into, we've discussed a lot of the independent variables so far and how they contribute to technology adoption, but we have our demographic variables of age, education, um, where they live, types of crop planted, 
Uh, do they have any sort of outside source of income from livestock or off-farm income? What's their attitude about climate change and risk? Uh, what does their loss experience contribute or consist of? Do they have access to extension services? Are, are they members in an agricultural cooperative? Um, are they in debt? So all of these things are going to contribute as variables in our model. One other thing I want to note, I originally had included land size as an independent variable. And in a couple of my equations, I do include it, but it is very highly correlated or highly related to the types of crop planted. And that creates some interference within the variables. So I took it out, um, but I'll go into that a little bit more and how we can test for that later on. So uh, the slide's a little bit, there's a lot going on. So again, just bear with me. So we have a couple different things. So farmers, have their decision to adopt and our variables might impact their decision to adopt or they might impact the adoption intensity. So on what percentage of their land did they adopt that new technology? Or the variable might impact both adoption intensity and decision to adopt. The variable might also impact uh, the our dependent variable, so adoption positively. So a certain variable might have a higher likelihood of causing technology adoption, or it might have a negative relationship and lead to a lower likelihood of technology adoption. Or on the other hand, there might be no relationship. So it has no impact on technology adoption. So we'll go over some of the more important things really quickly. So both growing rice and having access to intention, extension services had a positive effect or the increase the likelihood of a farmer deciding to adopt technology. And all of these things hold everything else constant. So if we say that growing rice added to the likelihood of a farmer adopting technology, that means that uh, extension services are exactly the same. Whether or not they're indebted, that's exactly the same. So we can isolate the variable for growing rice. Um, a couple things that have a negative relationship owning livestock and belonging to an agricultural cooperative. So these kinds of things decrease the likelihood of a farmer adopting new technology. Um, what we don't see as having any likelihood are our experience of climate change and loss. And again, we will go into that in a second as we interpret the results. So why is a type of crop important for adoption? So we know that rice, and we'll also see it I'll go back to adoption intensity because we know that, for example, cashews and kotsova increase the adoption intensity, but we see a negative relationship. So growing fruit or rubber, those kinds of things do not or lead to a decline in adoption intensity or sorry, the decision to adopt. So why is the type of crop important for adoption? Well, for one, different crops require different technologies. So this is going to be the most critical component. And I touched on this briefly a little bit earlier. So for example, rice uh, has a lot of access to uh, like high, diff higher volume seeds or um, higher yield seeds. So since this is a relatively easy change to adopt, for, uh, that's why you're going to see a higher likelihood of rice being adopted. Because in this study, we have a lot of different types of technology that are possible to include, and we don't control for specific sorts of technology, you're going to see that the types of crops become really relevant. Another thing is that uh, obviously different industries in Cambodia in the agriculture sector have different uh, levels of funding and different levels of government support. Rice and cashews are highly supported by the government. Uh, in recent years, we see the national uh, cashew policy. That's um, a strategy that the government has to increase cashew production over the next five years. So there's a lot of support services for the cashew industry. There's a lot of new technology available for cashew growers. Same with rice. It's such an important crop in Cambodia. It receives a lot of government focus. I want to also just make a quick caveat that we cannot attribute these factors just due to land sites or extension services, because again, we are controlling for them. So we are isolating these variables, keeping everything else constant. Again, uh, this slide has a lot going on, so just bear with me, we'll walk through it. Uh, livestock ownership, being belonging to an agricultural cooperative, 
and having off farm income all lead to less technology adoption. So there's a lot of potential reasons why this is. But first, let's think of increased wealth. So the farmers that are in these three groups tend to have greater wealth. Um, they either have greater assets or they have greater access to liquidity or um, not just liquidity, but um, like greater source of income beyond just farming. So could increased wealth be a factor to lesser technology adoption? Well, for one, no, because land size is a really key proxy for wealth. And we see no relation after controlling for crop type of land size to relate to adoption. Additionally, there's no theoretical framework to suggest that wealthier households are less likely to adopt new technology. So there's very limited likelihood that uh, increased wealth is the reason or is the driving factor behind this relationship. Another thing we can consider is that are these households suffering liquidity constraints? I argue that no, they're actually in fact having more liquidity. So one, uh, households that have livestock can sell their livestock, which adds to their liquidity. And two, we see that there's a very high rate of indebtedness and it's pretty easy for farmers to access loans. And farmers that are indebted have a higher likely to adopt technology. So farmers that are able to take out a loan which leads to being in debt, are able to adopt this technology. So we see limited liquidity constraints. So I don't attribute this relationship due to liquidity. However, let's look at our final factor. Are these households more risk averse? Now we see that these three strategies, livestock ownership, agricultural cooperatives, and having off-farm income are identified as a risk mitigation strategy. Even though farmers are not engaging in these uh, specifically to mitigate risk. But perhaps more risk averse households are engaging in these activities as a buffer against crop loss. So understanding this factor can lead us to potentially conclude or potentially um, understand this relationship that while more risk averse households might be having these income buffer, it might also lead to more risk averse households being less likely to adopt technology. So we see the third confounding variable of risk aversion, um, increasing the likelihood of livestock ownership, agricultural cooperative membership, off-farm income, and decreasing the likelihood of technology adoption. So what is the role of learning and adoption? And I touched on this briefly in looking at some of the commonly identified factors in uh, the literature, but learning plays a really critical role. Now, for one thing, we see extension services playing, having a positive role on technology adoption, and that's a really good thing. Um, you know, we want to see Cambodia's extension services as having a strong benefit on the farming population, and we do. Uh, we see almost a 20% increase in the likelihood to adopt technology after farmers have, exceed, have received an extension service. And again, that's just agricultural training in some sort of capacity. And I also do want to touch on agricultural cooperatives again, because it might not just be risk at play. We do know agricultural belonging to an agricultural cooperatives is a risk mitigation strategy, but it also can impact the, the social network you have, and especially related to farming. So what farmers are you viewing? So if farmer, if none of the farmers in this specific social network are adopting the technology, that's going to limit your likelihood to adopt that new technology. Uh, additionally, uh, some agricultural cooperatives might um, might like engage in certain limitations that make it hard to change like farming behavior. I will say, and again, I, I touched on this, but uh, technology adoption is an iterative process, so it happens over time. So this sec this study is only a cross sectional study, so the data was all taken at a specific moment in time. It would definitely be really useful for future researchers to study panel data to so to study how technology adoption changes for a specific farmer over time um, and how to look at like previous decisions impact their future decisions. So I had mentioned that we see no impact of loss and climate change as impacting adoption decisions. So I would argue that this is a little bit alarming. There's a relatively wide consensus in the literature 
uh, across the scientific community that climate change is going to be posing significant threat and challenge for farmers in tropical regions, specifically in to come. Um, so there's a couple of reasons why we might see no, no uh, any sort of change related to this. Um, on the one hand, there could be this belief that losses are inevitable. Uh, climate change is inevitable. What is the point of factoring this into your decision making and taking risk mitigation strategies for something that you can't even change? Um, so going forward, that's, that's a paradigm that we'd like to change. Um, we'd like to increase the agency that farmers have over, um, over like climate change and being able to adapt to climate change in a much more um, sustainable way. Another reason that we might see for this is that access to conservation agriculture, uh, these strategies are limited. So extension services are just not um, training for conservation agriculture in the way that they're training to increase like overall productivity. Uh, and so there's just a limited uh, like skills and technique knowledge about this. And a final factor is that immediate risk and reward play an outsized role in decision making. And this is almost in every decision making, but you see this specifically in farming, especially specifically in low income countries. So we're much more likely to uh, plant crops or make farming decision decisions based on what, what's going to happen in the next four months compared to what's going to happen in the next five, seven, 10 years. Um, so this is a disincentive towards sustainable agriculture practices. Uh, we see this a lot in, farmers all like following boom and bust cycles. Uh, this was really big during the cost of a boom about a decade ago, and you see it happening now with the cashew boom. So as, as we wind down, I want to discuss some policy implications behind the study findings. So most importantly, uh, extension services need to the investment in extension services need to be increased. We see only about half the farmers in the study having access to extension services. Now, compare that, that to the fact that we know that there's such an outsized impact of extension services, um, understanding how we can improve their quality and uh, their reach is really important. Uh, and then, like we just talked about, conservation agriculture, training on that and uh, skills increase, should certainly be um, certainly be added like towards the general curriculum of extension services. Um, now, while not directly in an extension services, there are limited financial literacy training. So trainings to increase um, understanding of debt, understanding of loans, insurance, saving, spending. Um, Incorporating some sort of financial literacy training in extension services can be really helpful in uh, reducing kind of the kind of the these dangerous features about indebtedness. Um, it's a little bit harder to integrate, but it is possible with different like organizational partnerships. What about the policy implications for technology development? At a very basic level. Uh, I would like to see farmers being uh, brought on much earlier in the technology development process and farmers being consulted uh, active participants in this process. Ultimately, farmers are not going to adopt technology that's not highly relevant to their crop production and it's not going to be relatively easy to use. Um, so very often in university settings or in um, corporate settings when technology is being developed, it has a very top-down approach. However, this isn't necessarily conducive to widespread adoption from smallholder farmers. Additionally, if we touch back on um, the two greatest losses being from rainfall volatility and incidences of like pest infest infestations, uh, I'd like to see increased research and development devoted to um, pest resistant crop varieties and drought resistant crop varieties. There's some really great research going on right now in Cambodia, and this has received more attention over the last couple of years and increased grant funding over the last couple of years, which is really important. Um, but obviously it's a long process, but it's continuing. And um, overall, there's a good trend towards that, uh, but, but it is a slow process. And then finally, uh, 
technology should not be developed as a monolith for agriculture and rather should be developed to specific types of technology uh, or specific types of crops uh, because understanding how we can maximize relative advantage and how we can um, optimize ease of use, these are the kinds of things that are really going to increase adoption. What about policy implications for risk reduction? Um, this is a lot harder to do on a micro level and um, kind of has to be initiated at a macro level. Um, so how can we implement policies that are designed to reduce risk for farmers? And so that a lot of these risk averse farmers um, will be in, or less disincentivized to adopt new technology. There's a lot of different uh, potential routes. So on the one hand, we can see um, increased labor formalization and social safety nets. Um, the International Labor Organization is working with the uh, Cambodian government to uh, increase the social safety nets now. And obviously there's a lot of labor informality, particularly in the agriculture sector in Cambodia. But uh, working to increase the access that farmers have to your basic safety nets like health insurance and pensions can really reduce a lot of the risk that farmers face. A bit more complex is crop insurance, but there are some really good programs that are trying to initiate crop insurance schemes. So uh, this can include weather index insurance, area yield in index insurance, and sometimes it can be from large private insurance and sometimes it can be at a very micro insurance level from microfinance institutions, but all of these things help to counteract risk. Uh, and then briefly before I get into the conclusion, uh, we talked a lot about how farmers and people in general are more likely to consider the immediate uh, the immediate risk and reward as a, composed to uh, the long-term risk and reward. So we're not very good at delayed gratifications as humans. However, if we bundle um, technology adoption products or crop insurance products with, uh, or other risk reduction products, I should say, with uh, more short-term benefits, benefits, such as reductions in fertilizer or other input costs that can help increase the uptake of these products. Anyway, uh, I'd like to leave you with a couple key takeaways from the presentation. One, and most importantly, is technology adoption is critical for agricultural development. Uh, agricultural and rural poverty cannot be reduced without increasing the productivity of the agricultural sector. Um, and understanding this within the constraints in Cambodia is really critical. And again, while most farmers are aware and relatively concerned about climate change, there's still very little uh, adoption of conservation agriculture. So working towards increased um, soil and water preservation strategies is again, really critical. Uh, the most extreme loss event for farmers is rainfall volatility. So designing technology and designing crops that help mitigate the risk from rainfall volatility, that's really critical. Increasing the access and ensuring that access remains to extension services. It has a really large effect and a really positive impact on technology adoption. It reduces the skill limitation that we see for farmers. So ensuring that extension services are distributed equi equitably and with quality is really important. Finally, risk aversion and uh, understanding how we can help risk averse farmers adopt technology and finding types of technology that are compatible with all different types of crops, these are going to be our critical strategies to increasing technology adoption. Um, but yeah, those that that is my presentation. Um, I think there's some questions in the q and I know uh, Pamela has some questions, so I will leave it there. Thank you so much, Rachel, for your very comprehensive presentation on the topic. Um, yes, we have a couple of questions from our audience in the Zoom and uh, the Facebook page. So uh, one quick question from, uh, from our Facebook audience. Uh, so Dani Tan, she was asking uh, where can she get the report? Is it available online or? Uh, when can we expect to see the full report? Uh, yeah, so right now it's in some draft stages. 
Uh, it's in working paper stages. Uh, hopefully the full report will be published uh, in late May or early June. Um, and it'll be circulated then. Uh, thank you, thank you. We will be waiting for your full report to be published. And another question from uh, Patrick. Uh, Patrick asked, uh, if you can clarify, how can you define the member or social group in your study? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the social groups that were included, uh, it was pretty broad. Uh, it could be a religious organization. It could be a leadership organization in the community. Uh, a lot of farmers were members of like savings groups. Um, uh, there was a sports recreation like group about that. Um, but we also left it open to farmers to select like any sort of other organizations. So it was pretty, very broad. Uh, but think like your basic social organizations like that. I will just add, yeah. originally I did have a social connectedness index. So mm -hmm. this we had asked farmers to um, rank a couple different statements similar to uh, our other like ranking questions or rating questions about how how connected they felt to other farmers in the community, how to their family, to um, different NGOs in the community, to other farmers, um, and if they were member, like how many members of a social group were they in, um, because of this strong. Uh, impact that social networks have on technology adoption. However, we didn't really see any uh, relationship there. And this is largely due in that just because someone is more socially connected, it's more important about who you're connected to rather than mm -hmm. like to what extent you're connected. Uh, but anyway, social groups were defined in a very broad. Right. Um, we also have two questions about gender differences and I will be uh, integrating them together. Uh, one of which asking if you see any gender differences in tech adoption um, uh, in your study and uh, what are some of the social, cultural and economic barrier women face in adopting the agricultural technology in Cambodia? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, I'll start by saying, so this study was conducted at the household level. So when you see gender of uh, like male or female, that's mm -hmm. defined for the household head. Um, so ultimately technology, the decision to adopt technology is designed at the household level or whoever's the family that owns the land is deciding at that factor. Very often we consider technology adoption as uh, either happens at a single point in time or from one single person, but it's actually an intra-household decision-making process. So there's going to be dialogue between the different people in the household. Uh, although I didn't find any relationship between gender in this study, uh, other studies have found that uh, there sometimes women can be more risk averse. So uh, if you have a situation in which farmers that tend to be more risk averse are less likely to adopt new technology, then you're also going to have a higher likelihood that women are less likely to adopt new technology. Um, and then I'll touch briefly that uh, typically women, uh, we see less education for women, we see uh, limited access to capital and liquidity. So when these kinds of things are constraining features for technology adoption, uh, that's going to hurt women more than men. Again, I can't touch on that too specifically for this study because it was at the household level, not at the individual level. Um, but understanding like the gender decision-making process is definitely important. So a quick question. Uh, how many participants in your study uh, are women as the head of household? Um, let me, it's about, I'm pretty sure it's about 48. 48. Um, but I'll double check that. Yeah, 48. Right. Um, any other barrier uh, in addition to the 
let's say, social, cultural, and economic uh, barrier for women, uh, any barrier that, that constrains women from the uh, decision making in adapting technology? I mean, obviously, um, I, I think that there, there is a, a cultural component there. I can't speak too much on that because not Cambodian, but uh, you, you do see that play a, a, a strong role, especially in more rural communities. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, there have been some studies shown about, so when farmers, uh, or not farmers, but just people in general, like if you have an uh, otherwise equivalent man and woman, when they receive a loan, and if this loan is specifically for an income generating practice, so whether that's for a small business or that's for like a farming practice to purchase some sort of capital for farming. Uh, men gener typically generate more income from that individual loan than women. However, mm -hmm. women are often more likely to pay that loan back. So again, we kind of see this in this general idea, which is contested in the literature, but there is a theory that men tend to be more risk taking, uh, whether that be they have more opportunities to take, take risks. Um, but we, we see this kind of relationship with capital um, that relates to this risk aversion. So of women potentially being more risk averse than men. There's no clear and cut like data on that, but some like researchers have proposed that as a theory of why we might see some of these dynamics. I got it. And uh, we have one question about the uh, extension service from Randy. Um, is it free in the research uh, is at the extension extension service uh, uh, available for farmer are free yeah most of the time yes they are free a lot of times they're run by like the ministry of agriculture um, and they're like provincial and district departments um, sometimes they're run by like local ngos or agricultural organizations agricultural cooperatives mm -hmm. agricultural cooperatives often do have a small like membership fee it might be like five or ten bucks at the start okay. of the year, um, same with the farmer associations. Um, there are some private enterprises that run extension services. Those are less common and they are also conducted for a small fee. Uh, and then, but you also see a ton of like digital agricultural extension services. And these can be run through email, social media, tech services uh, like Facebook. So there's the vast majority of extension services are free. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, we have one question from the chat. Um, uh, based on the research finding regarding the technology and behavior change outline in the slides, would you please uh, elaborate further on what technology is capable of achieving? I'm sorry, wait, do you mind repeating that one more time? Okay. Um, could you please elaborate further on what what type of technology of uh, is capable of achieving more in terms of uh, adoption decision making of the farmer? So so is it is it asking like what types of technology? Yeah, have because the potential technology to... is quite very broad, right? So what what type of it? Which which one of it that is more likely to be achieved further to be adopted uh, by it. the farmer? Yeah. Yeah, I think. Optimizing fertilizer usage and pesticide usage, that is um, probably the simplest, the first step mm -hmm. in optimizing agricultural production. Uh, and this is where extension services can be so critical and that there's a lot, of, uh, typically just a lack of um, like technical skill when it comes to fertilizer adoption and pesticide adoption. There's obviously very limited formal training. So extension services, can really fill this gap. Um, that's one, one really critical thing we see. Um, there's a ton of research and development on higher yield seed varieties or hybrid seed varieties, especially in rice. And I see this definitely as being one of the more highly adopted mm -hmm. technology features um, like as over the next decade or so. Um, I think it's, it's relatively cheap compared to like mechanized irrigation, for example, uh, and it can have a really um, re high relative advantage. So I can conclude that based on your answer, the technology needs to be easy to access, right, uh, convenient, and it needs to be 
uh, apply to the rice crop and uh, need to be cheap, right? In order to be uh, achieving more in uh, technological adoption of the farmer, right? Right. So it does not does not necessarily ha have to be um, applied to rice crops, and we certainly need to be making sure that technology is adopted for some of these higher value crops. Uh, mm -hmm. Ideally, a lot of farmers are moving towards these higher value crops. It's just because obviously rice is so is grown by almost every farmers. Farmers, mm -hmm. for example, that grow cashews at least have like one hectare of rice that they grow as well. It's just mm -hmm. so like culturally and traditionally ingrained. Um, but yeah, so as you touched on compatibility for the specific crop and industry and the market forces mm -hmm. that are behind that industry, that's key. Uh, ease of use, relative advantage, price, those are key. A couple other things, observability. So farmers mm -hmm. being able to see it in use, that can help with adoption. And then trialability. So farmers being able to try it maybe for one harvest season, and then if they don't like it, they can go back to how it was. So something that's not necessarily a permanent change. Uh, that can also increase uh, like the likelihood of adoption. Uh, a quick follow-up question. Um, how about the supply chain of this technology you mentioned at the moment? Is it competitive in the Cambodia market or is it still only few? Um, a lot of the technology is, is imported from China or Vietnam, Thailand. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenge because it it, it it adds to like the input cost that the farmers have. So overall that's going to decrease their profits. So it, it just adds to like, it's just one more challenge. Um, there are a lot, like a lot of um, the universities in Cambodia ha are having really good research. Um, and a lot of the universities also contribute to like local extension efforts. Um, mm -hmm. So so that's good. Um, obviously the Ministry of Ag has a lot of funding for um, local, like technology development efforts, it, it definitely is hard to compete with uh, neighboring countries' technology imports. I will say that. But there are a lot of efforts being undertaken to develop like the domestic technology industry in Cambodia. Okay, uh, we have one question from Christina about the um, data you use in your research. Uh, she was asking if you came across information about uh, the source sources farmer use for seeds uh, and cons uh, considering domestic production is limited and official import record seem unavailable. Is it available for you? So is is it available for where farmers are getting their seeds? Um, so a lot of, um, I don't know if this answers your question, but um, a lot of the farmers they they get their seeds and fertilizer. They'll be like a local district distributor, um, so it'll it'll oftentimes just be like a local market that's maybe like twenty minute drive away, um, and they'll get their seeds at the at the start of the season. Uh, sometimes farmers use seeds from the previous harvest. Um, that's not as common, uh, but I'm not sure which like country specifically the seeds are imported from. Okay. Um, some seeds are developed domestically. Fertilizer is almost always imported. But the the official document or report is um, limited, right? Uh, when uh, it comes yes, to yes, I, ha I have yet to find find that okay. specific report. Okay, okay, think about it. Uh, one last question from our audience. Uh, Somebody she was about asked if this research report will be shared to the government. After you publish it, will you send it to the government? Definitely, so yeah. So um, I'm very lucky that, so one of my research affiliates, uh, Preklia National Institute of Agriculture, mm -hmm. they're like a subset of the Ministry of Agriculture. So, um, and I have really great partners over there that help me like share information to um, like government officials. So, so we can try to really like work together uh, partner some recommendations. Um, and, and I'd also ideally like to uh, work with some of the local governments from Kampong Cham and Tabung uh, so we mm -hmm. can get the results back to the farmers that actually participated in the study. All right. Um, I actually have a few questions. I think we have enough time for some of my questions. Uh, so, 
first first question what are some of the way to reduce the risk for farmer or have more risk adverse farmer uh, to adapt new technology yeah so we touched on this a little bit um crop insurance i think mm -hmm. um has been something that in the last couple of years in cambodia has definitely had like a resurgence in in thought and like the forte insurance company that's really big in cambodia they've been piloting some crop insurance programs across the country Crop insurance is a really good risk mitigation strategy. Naturally, so farmers can pay uh, maybe 10 bucks in the beginning of the year. And then if they have a certain amount of crop loss at the end of the year, they they can file a claim and get that money back. Uh, it's a really difficult program to start up because you need a ton of data. Uh, to be profitable, you need a lot of farmers to sign up. Uh, as we discussed, there's really low financial literacy for farmers in Cambodia. So it's difficult to get a lot of uh, demand, funding, investment behind it, but it has the potential to um, really act as a strong safety net for farmers that go to adopt a potentially slightly riskier um, technology, but a technology that could potentially have really high yields. Um, you also get into a lot of issues like with moral hazard, so, or adverse selection, so we don't want farmers who are more risk averse to only be the ones buying insurance and then suddenly insurance is getting paid out almost every year. Uh, we don't want necessarily farmers that once they have insurance, they're like, great, uh, time to adopt a lot um, risky technology. So there's a lot of tricky challenges with that. There is a lot of really good work that's been going on in in the um, like financial sector with crop insurance because um, people do see that there's a lot of uh, a potentially really large market for it, but it's mm -hmm. definitely still in its like nascent stages in Cambodia. And then I also touched on this earlier, um, but increasing formalization in uh, for the informal sector like in agriculture. So having farmers being registering their uh, crop production with the Ministry of Ag, with the Ministry of Labor Vocational Training. That can allow them to access like the National Social Security Fund, that can allow them to access health insurance plans. So when they experience a crop loss, it's not so dire, it's not like almost this world ending phenomenon. Um, I think those are the two main ways that risk can be reduced. Obviously we see uh, like agricultural production risk mm -hmm. mitigation strategies. So joining agricultural cooperatives, potentially contract farming. Uh, we didn't have any contract farmers in the study, but uh, in other parts of Cambodia, that is becoming a little bit more widespread, but it's still, again, um, not super widespread. Um, so I think those are probably the the main ways for, as in terms of policy, policy implication, how to reduce risk. How about the uh, climate change? Climate change. Uh, there was a big answer from your finding that uh, despite the fact that uh, climate change exists and uh, it costs loss to the farmer, but uh, it seems like they do not tend to they 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 not tend to adapt to new technology due to this reason. Um, what can Cambodia do to mitigate this area? Or what would be your suggestion in this? Uh, element? I think far and away, number one is incorporating uh, soil and water preservation strategies in extension services. Uh, that's definitely something that's lacking. Um, and making and making sure that these conservation strategies are not necessarily limiting income. It's going to be really hard for a farmer to switch to a strategy that's sure it's more sustainable, but it's going to reduce their income. So ensuring that like these those two goals are compatible. Uh, that's critical. Um, so ensuring that extension services can do that with within um, within those two constraints, that's going to be key. Uh, bundling services can be really helpful. So bundling uh, certain certain types of fertilizer seeds uh, with types of technology that are going to be more um, sustainable or more eco friendly that's going to be critical. So anytime that we can bundle a short risk re or short-term reward with the long-term sustainable sustainability strategy, that's going to be critical. Right, and one last question from me. Uh, your research is mainly uh, in the Eastern part of Cambodia. Right? 
in the bone common and compound chain. Is it possible to generalize your finding uh, the result uh, for the rest of Cambodia as a whole? I think some of the results, yes. Some of the results, uh, the study would have to be replicated. So, uh, for example, a lot of stuff is, uh, it's not necessarily dependent on where in Cambodia you are, but it's dependent on how close you are to an urban center. How close are you to the border with Vietnam? How close are you to the border with Thailand? So I think it's generalizable in the sense of um, farmers that are growing the same things, dealing in within the same uh, like supply chain structure are going to face the same challenges. Um, but a really, a farmer, for example, in like really remote Ratana Kiri, they're going to be facing different challenges due to their specific circumstance that's very close to Phnom Penh. Um, so to an extent, I think it's generalizable. Um, with, for example, like what we see with risk aversion and agricultural cooperatives and livestock ownership as a risk mitigation strategy, I think you can generalize that. I think you can generalize um, farmers being less inclined to adopt long-term risk mitigation strategies compared to short-term risk mitigation strategies. Um, but um, certain things just need to be cognizant of what uh, access people have to uh, like local value chains and services. Okay, that is all from me. And I think we do not have uh, any other question or comment from the audience in Zoom and uh, Facebook Live. Uh, I would like to conclude uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rachel Brown, for your time. And thank you so much all the audience uh, all over the world that participated in this uh, webinar. And uh, please be informed that uh, this video will be made available in our uh, YouTube channel and uh, uh, CKS website. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for coming. If anyone has any questions, uh feel free to contact me and I can answer you directly. Happy to share any study results or talk more about like the specific kind of metrics or technical stuff behind it. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, bye. bye, -bye.